Take your Bible. I have, uh, we're, we're studying God. So um, we were talking last Wednesday night about God being everlasting. So we're going to look at a little bit more of that. Uh, I can't remember where I stopped last Wednesday night, so I'm going to back up a little bit, make sure I get it all covered. And um, does everybody have a sheet with all the verses on it? Does anybody need one? You guys need one? Here we go. Who else? Okay. I got a couple. Y'all need one or two? One is fine. Does he not read? <laughs> Helen, does he not read? Okay. <laughs> okay. Who else? Anybody? Anybody? All right. All right. That's homework. I'm glad you did. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and uh, pray for, like I say, pray for Sweetie Pie, pray for uh, Sister Linda's recovering at um, Crystal Oaks, Sister Bernice. Somebody, bless their heart, donated some money for a little bit for Sister Linda, a little bit for Sister Bernice. They never met them, but they sent a little money for both of them there while they're there. So praise the Lord for that. I'm not going to give you a name out because that way your blessing's intact. Yes, dear? Okay. Uh, Philip uh, is in a bad way. That's all I'm going to say. And um, really pray for him. Um, he's just somebody you, I don't want to give up on him. And um, so I'm going to keep praying for him. And pray that when he departs this world, as we all will... They'll, he'll do it on God's terms. He'll do it with God on his side. Amen. We have an advocate with the Father, which means that we have the best defense attorney in the world. And he will vouch for us that we are innocent. Think about that. He's not lying either. The bill's already been paid, and he has proof of it. So we'll pray for that. Just pray that God will bless us. Uh, during our study tonight, I think we finally got our internet fixed. So we, that, we had a little trouble with it yesterday during Pastor Mike Online, but I recorded it and it's, we have it up online if you want to watch it. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, it's good. Father, you gave us a beautiful day. It started out cloudy and cool and boy, this nice warm weather just blesses our hearts. And so Father, we thank you for it. We thank you, Lord, for bringing us back into your house and Lord, we love you, and we love the fellowship with our brothers and sisters, and we love uh, knowing, God, that the people that are with us every week, every time, Lord, they're with us online, and that blesses us, and I hope, Father, that we can be a blessing to them. Thank you, Lord, for all the people that called and I talked to today, and I pray, dear God, that you would just encourage them wherever they are, and bless them, Lord, and, and Lord, just, just fill them for them being a blessing to us here. Lord, we just pray, God, that you would allow us to continue to do that. However, Lord, you choose to do it, it's up to you. And Father, we're just glad to be in your kingdom. Lord, the devil's got a lot more people on his side than we do. But we have a lot more angels on our side. And we have our advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Father, thank you for that. Thank you for giving us your word. Thank you, God, for making it right and showing us the way that we are to go. Lord, we sang the song, how the by God's word, at last my sin I learned. And I thank you for the Bible showing me the error of all my ways. And there are many. So God, correct us and teach us and help us, Father, and equip us so that we're able to teach others who need to know who the real God is. Blessed and honor your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Uh, Jarrett, let's see here. Where do I want to go here? I want to start with, I had up on the screen a while ago. Let me go through these verses very quickly. This deals with God being everlasting. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. So if God's strength is everlasting, then God is everlasting. And that means everlasting in the past and everlasting in the future and being with us even now. Isaiah 40 verse 28, Hast thou not known? 
Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. Now that verse we could use to go into the next section. The next section, we're going to talk about God's power and just how much power God has. But that verse where it gives God the title of everlasting God, gives him the title of Lord, and he's the creator, he fainteth not, neither is weary. Does God ever sleep? Has he ever slept? No. He's never slept because he's never been tired. God doesn't go on vacation. God doesn't say, you know what? I've had it with you people. I'm sick of you. Now, here's what's interesting. We know that Jesus, when he was on the earth, because he was fully man, along with being fully God, there were times when Jesus had to get away even from his closest disciples. He had to be away from them and, and sort of rest himself and sort of get alone with God. Jesus told us that when we pray, we ought to get in a closet and pray. I, I've done that before. Have you? You ever gotten in? I mean, get in your closet. It's hard to do in a camper trailer, all right? But I've been in the closet before, me and God. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it as making God see things my way. It's telling God to make me see it his way is what I was doing. But he's never weary. He never faints. He never gets tired. He's holding the universe in the span of his hand and it's not wearing him out at all. Isaiah 63, 16, Doubtless thou art our father, though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not. Thou, O Lord, art our father, our redeemer. Thy name is from everlasting. That phrase from everlasting is uh, also in Micah chapter 5, where it talks, if that's for me, tell him I'll call back. But, but thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Same phrase there that you find, uh, where was it? Back here in Isaiah 63, 16. He is from everlasting. Meaning that before Genesis 1, verse 1, God is. Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. And we talked last Wednesday about God being ever present with us and with all of his creation. Jeremiah 10, 10, but the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and an everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth shall tremble and the nation shall not be able to abide his indignation. By the way, had a had a phone call from a guy. He, he pre said he appreciated where I was talking about there in, um, oh, I can't remember where it was, where God was talking about, I am God. There was no God before me. And and he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to use that. Mormons teach that the God that we have now, Elohim, was not always a God. He was a man on a planet who had a God over him. And when that God, when that man, Elohim, died, he was brought into the celestial realm and given his own planet to become God over, which is this planet here. Does anybody happen to know the name of the planet that they say God came from? Anybody know? Huh? Krypton? It's close. Kolob. K-O-L-O-B. Did you know the TV show Battlestar Galactica was based upon Mormon doctrine? There was a leader and his name was what? Adama. Adam and he had a council of 12 just like the Mormon church does and they were leaving the planet Kolob and search of earth so they could inhabit earth and fill it full of people it's all based on Mormon doctrine it's nuts okay science fiction that's our whole religion is science fiction amen Oh, but anyway, Daniel 4, 3, How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. His kingdom always extends throughout all of eternity. 
his dominion. He was in charge of the day when Adam was alive. God was in charge when Noah was alive. God was in charge when when Moses was alive. God was in charge when Jesus walked the earth. God has been in charge ever since then. Do not believe, and that's where we get into God's power. Do not believe charismatic doctrine that teaches that God is powerless until you speak the right words. Then God can do something. More, uh, what was I saying? Charismatic doctrine basically says that Satan has total dominion over this whole world. And God is powerless against him unless we release God to go to work and to fight Satan. Stupid. If that's their God, they can keep him, but it's not my God. Then we, of course, we read Micah 5, 2, and how we saw last week how the NIV messes that verse up. They say whose origins have been, um, I can't remember from, um, whose origins have been of old from ancient times or something like that. But it basically says that Jesus had an origin or a beginning. Romans 16, 26, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandments of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. So God's word is everlasting. God is everlasting. And the same attributes that you apply to God, you also apply to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is also as everlasting as God the Father is. Jesus did not have a beginning, therefore he does not have an end. As God was eternal, so is Christ. Even as his son, he is eternal, and so is the Holy Ghost. Now, and I would say even the word too. Because the Bible says, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. So this Bible that you have has always been in existence. It's always been. Never, never. Has it ever, has one word faded away? Uh, so now let's look at the next part. God is all powerful. The word is omnipotent. That word, that actual word is found one time in the King James in Revelation 19. We'll get to that, but I'll share a story today. A lady called me and um, I may deal with this tomorrow on Pastor Mike Online. But a lady called me today and asked me a question about, she had heard a preacher on a local radio station that said that in Acts chapter 12, the King James had a mistake in it. And I knew what she was talking about. In Acts chapter 12, you'll find the word Easter there. And these guys who like to pretend that they're smarter than the Bible, and smarter than the translator, smarter than God, say that that's a grievous error, that that word should have never been put into the Bible. That's why I don't believe the King James, because it has that error in it. So, and basically what it does, anybody, anybody, who says things like that, like, oh, the King James has errors in it. Pride tells them to say that. I know because I said it. And I know what compels them. I know what drives them. With, I guarantee you it's pride. Because while this man would say the King James has errors in it, he would want you to believe that he doesn't have errors in what he says. What he does, he magnifies himself. Remember 2 Thessalonians 2, the man of sin, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. And any time any preacher or anybody says there are mistakes in all the Bibles, there is not a perfect Bible anywhere, they have exalted themselves or somebody else above the word of God. And God himself would not even magnify his name above his word. He magnified his word above his name. So I, I told her, you know, my, my take on Acts chapter 12, I told her it is the right translation. It's, it's perfect. And I may explain that tomorrow. But I, I gave her, I said, you know, I've heard me talk. There's two rules. Rule number one is there are no mistakes in the Bible. Rule number two, somebody says there is. Go back to rule number one. There are no mistakes in the Bible. There cannot be. God never tells us that there's an error or a mistake in his word. So this is where we get into, number one, God is everlasting and so is his word. Number two, God is all powerful and so is his word. Jesus said, you do err 
not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. Jesus connected it together. The power and the word of God and the power of God are connected together. And if your Bible has errors and mistakes in it, then that's where it would be weak. And you cannot trust it. Cannot trust it. And I don't know about you, but I've got enough mistakes and errors in my life. I need my Bible to be right in everything it says. Everything. I need something to be right. Amen? Can't trust me. Can't trust others. Can't trust churches. Can't trust preachers. Can't trust popes. Can't trust politicians. Can't trust salesmen. I trust the Word of God alone to be right 100% of the time. Now, God is powerful. So, I like these young people here. So I'm going to ask them some questions. All right, everybody listen up now, you young ones. Listen up. All right, Liam. Is God strong enough to break a tree in half? Yes. All right, Hope. Is God strong enough to hold all of the whole planet Earth in his hand like that. Is God strong enough to do that? How long can he do that? Forever, she said. That's a smart girl. Hi. Hi back there. Is God strong enough to keep Michaela and Jaden from fighting one another? Your little girl back there next to him is going, uh-uh. There ain't a force in nature that can stop that. So God's strong, isn't he? I mean, think about Samson. You know Samson in the Bible, right? Samson took a jawbone of a donkey. How many people did he kill with it? Does anybody know? Any of you young people know? How many? What do you say, Hope? I'll take a hundred because I don't remember the number. I'll take a hundred. Can you imagine a man taking a bone about like that and killing a hundred men? That's strong. That is strong. Where did he get that strength from? He got it from God. So, all right. Who's awake? Uriah. Is God strong enough to beat up the devil. Yes. Aren't you glad? All you adults say amen. First Chronicles 29 11. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. It's five things here. Greatness, power, glory, victory, majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Has anybody ever played that game where all the kids get out and uh, there's different versions of it, but we used to take a football, throw it up in the air, and whoever caught it, everybody else would try to tackle him. You ever played that game? I won't tell you what we called it, but we used to play it. Huh? 500? I don't know that. I know the other term, but I don't know that one. All right. Okay. But anyway, whoever was strong enough to hold on to the football without everybody beating him, he was the winner. Now, what this is saying is that there is nobody who is strong enough to kill God. No one is strong enough to defeat God. God and God has enemies that want to destroy God Satan Satan wants to destroy God and he's going to he's been trying it and he's going to try it at the end of this time Christ is going to reign a thousand years God's going to let him up out of the pit he's going to try it again 
And he's going to fail every single time because to, with God is all the power. Revelation 19. In fact, turn to Revelation 19. Oh, I like Revelation 19. For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. What is that from? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We ought to sing that Sunday. Hallelujah chorus. Think we can do it? It'd be rough. Revelation 19. Man, look at this. Verse 1, after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power, there it is, unto the Lord our God, for true and righteous are His judgments. That's talking about His Word. His Word is true and His Word is right. For He hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of His servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia. What does the word Alleluia mean? Huh? Praise the Lord. Um, yeah, Yah, at the end of that word, is Yah, Jehovah, or Jah, um, hallelujah, verse 5, and a voice came out of the throne saying, praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great, and I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, say, hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. He is, and that's the only time in the Bible you'll find that word, omnipotent. Omni means all the way or complete, covering everything. Potent means powerful. He is a potentate. In fact, that word's in the Bible, I think. The potentate, the great and mighty potentate. And he is omnipotentate, which means that there is nothing more powerful than God is. Somebody say amen. Amen. Uh, First Chronicles 29, 12. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all, and in thy hand is power and might, and in thy hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now, I like this. I'll tell you why. Turn to Revelation 5. Mm, mm, mm. Who in here has ever had to fight the devil? Now, I'll, I'll give you the secret to fighting the devil. You listening? Every now and then, God will let you get whooped. Did he not do that with Joshua? When they went against Ai the first time, God let them get whooped. But the second time, they were successful. Now, God will let you get beat to train you, to teach you something. But we all have to fight the devil, and all of us need help to do it. So, the Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, meaning the devil. Now, what is it that's in us. Number one, we know it's Christ. I am in Christ and Christ is in me. Sounds like a contradiction, but it's not. But then what else is in us? The Holy Spirit is in us. It dwells in us. We have the Spirit of God's Son in us crying, Abba, Father. But then thy word have I hid it in my heart that I might not sin against God. So we have God's word in us as well. Now, in 1 Chronicles 29, where it says, In thine hand is power and might. You, are, you ought to know where I'm going with this. Revelation 5, verse 1, I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book, written within and on the back side, seed, sealed with seven seals. The power that is in God's hand is your Bible. That's your sword. When Jesus comes back in Revelation 19... What's coming out of his mouth is his sharp, two-edged sword. It is his word. Paul said that we're wrestling against principalities and powers. And he said, put on the full armor of God. And he said, take you the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So I believe I have experienced it. 
I've read it in the scriptures and I believe it with all my heart. To get victory is not with you. The only way that you can is for God's word to be present in you. And you can beat the devil with God's word. How do you do that? Well, Jesus gave us an example. Because in Luke chapter 4, Jesus was 40 days in the wilderness. And the devil came to him to tempt him. Jesus was hungry. Jesus was thirsty. He was very weak. And so the devil came when he was at his weakest point. And the devil came to him, tempted him three times, tempted him with lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And all three times, Jesus did nothing except say, it is written. It is written. It is written. So, this pastor, this lady was talking about today. He does not believe that the Bible is the sword, the strong sword of the Word of God. How can he defeat the devil if his sword is weak? How can he, how can he have power in his life? Well, they don't, but they pretend to. In some of the services, they love to raise their hands. and I don't have anything against raising your hands. They love to make a big show. They love to have a big emotional service that lifts everybody's emotions and they call that the power of God. In some churches, they, they run around. They do. They run around. They dance or they handle snakes. That's dumb. But they do these things and they claim that that's evidence of God's power. In some churches, they'll play the music really loud and really fast and repetitive to get everybody into a, a, a musical frenzy. And they say, that's the power of God. But once they walk out the doors, their life at home is the exact same as it was when they came to the church that they went to. It's not different. They pretend it is, but it's not any different. But they have to have these things as a replacement because they have slowly but surely moved away the sharp two-edged sword, the power of God from that church. So they had to invent a false power that does not change lives. I told the lady on the phone, I read her first Peter chapter two, I said, to me, this Bible's precious, just like Jesus is. I said, this Bible's saved my life, saved my soul, saved my family, saved my church, saved my ministry. This Bible's precious to me. I mean, who in this world would die for a book? I mean, who would, who would die for a Harry Potter book. If they said, we're going to kill everybody that has a Harry Potter book, who would die? Who would be willing to stand up and die for that book? Maybe some crazy people would. But I would die. I would give my life for the sake of the honor of this book. Because it is the power of God that's in, in thine hand is power and might. And what's in God's hand is his word. The strength that Samson had was the seven locks of his hair. The seven locks are the seven horns on the lamb, which are the seven spirits of God. And those seven spirits of God are still the word of God. And what Delilah is doing is shaving off the locks of the power that are in churches. And here it is. God has all power, all strength, and all might. And he is willing to give that to each one of us as a free gift. And it, it is a gift because at no time when God's power has ever been on you, at no time did you ever do anything to deserve it. That's the truth. 
Uh, mm, yeah, look at, that, look at that verse, 2 Chronicles 25, 8. But if thou wilt go, do it, be strong for the battle. God shall make thee fall before the enemy, for God hath power to help and to cast down. God has the power to help you and sustain you, or God has the power to cast you down. And everybody is going to stand before God in judgment. And God has the, the judicial, legislative, political power to say to you, Depart from me, you work of iniquity, for I knew you not. And God has the power to command angels to grab you and cast you into hellfire. That's power. God has the power to do it. So God either has the power to lift you up and sustain you, or God has the power to cast you down. You decide which one you want. Amen? Job 1, 12, and the, look at this. The Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thy hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Now God had power. God had all authority over Job and every aspect of Job's life. Satan did not have that power originally. And that is a big doctrinal mistake that the charismatic movement makes is that they claim that Satan, that Adam or God, they claim, Kenneth Copeland said this, that God lost the earth to Satan. He said that. So under that premise, Satan then has the power to kill each one of us at his will, if he wants to. According to what they believe, Satan can do anything to you that he pleases. And God can't do anything about it except you give God permission to do it. By your magic words. That doctrine's from hell. And this passage right here. Satan had absolutely zero authority over Job. Except what God allowed Satan to have. He said, all that he have is in thy power. And Satan did it. I mean, he killed his family, took away all of his stuff, took all of his wealth, took everything. But he had to stop right there because God prohibited Satan from going after Satan's physical, or Job's physical body. But then, in chapter 2, Satan comes back. Wants more of the, of the pie here. So God says, okay, you can attack his body, but I'm limiting you that you cannot kill him. Now, does that mean that Satan is going to sneak behind God's back and kill Job anyway? No. God would not allow it. God has, now you listen to this. God always has total control over Satan. Always. Don't believe anything else because it's not in your Bible. Job 37, verse 23, touching the Almighty, we cannot find him out. He is excellent in power and in judgment and in plenty of justice. He will not afflict. That word excellent in power means he excels in power. There is nothing more powerful than God. Psalm 62, 11, God has spoken once. Twice have I heard this, that power belongeth. Notice that he said God spoke once and then he said it twice. Here again, we're back to the Bible. The Old Testament, God speaks once. New Testament, God speaks twice. The power of God. Uh, Psalm 66, 3. Say unto God, how terrible art thou in thy works. Through the greatness of thy power shall thine enemies submit thy, themselves unto thee. Look at your Bible. It says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall... And I heard an idiot on Christian radio years ago say, that verse... You know where it talks about every knee should bow and every tongue should confess? That doesn't say that they will, it just says that they should. Oh no, you're, you're an idiot. You're not reading the rest of the Bible. Every knee absolutely shall bow. The greatness of thy power shall thine enemies submit themselves unto thee. Even when Micaiah saw... There in the presence of God, all of the spirits, both clean and unclean. And God is asking who will go and, and make sure Ahab gets in the battle tomorrow. There was one spirit that said, I'll go be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And God said, go do it. God controlled even the lying spirit. So now you, you, you ponder this for a minute. Who in here knows somebody that right now you know that they are in false doctrine and it's troubling you?
You know somebody right now that's that way. I hope you're not thinking of me. The truth of the matter is, God turned them over to that. That's tough. Because God could have turned us over to that as well. Would he have a right to? Oh, a million times over. God should have cast every one of us into the pit already. God should have turned us off. We, should have, we could have been probably the best Mormons in the world. Best Jehovah's Witness, best whatever. We could have been the most wicked, perverted doctrines. We could have believed all of that stuff. God could have turned us over to that, but he refused. He brought us to the side of truth. That was the power of God. I mean, think about it. What did you used to be, John? He went, bad. That's a goat. But God had so much power over you, he changed your whole mind. Did you not at one time hate the Bible? You should have seen his... I watch people. When I said that, he went, yeah. He looked down. You know what that is? Shame. Shame. He's telling the truth, and yet God brought you to the truth. God will either bring you to the truth or he'll tone you over to a reprobate mind. It's in God's power. Psalm 66, he ruleth by his power forever. His eyes behold the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. Psalm 106, nevertheless, he saved them for, for his name's sake that he might make his mighty power to be known. Why did God save you? So, John, I'll go back to you. People that knew you back in the day when you hated God, now they know you, now that you love God, God is saying here that he saved you for, not for your sake, for his name's sake. To show the people that know you what God can do in a person's life to make you a brand new person. So his mighty power. I mean, the Bible even tells us. Remember Pharaoh chasing after the Israelites into the Red Sea? Remember that? God tells us in his word. That he did, he raised up Pharaoh to be a hard shelled nugget, an idiot with a beast mentality. God made him that way so that he could show the world his mighty power. And I get that image in my mind of Charlton Heston there at the Red Sea. Behold God's power. I love that. Amen. And the Red Sea opens up and God saves his people. And then he's just holding it back, waiting for Pharaoh and all of his guys to go in. And that's exactly what they do. And God did all of that on purpose. Whew. Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. Isaiah 40, he giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increases strength. That is 2 Corinthians 12. Where Paul had the thorn in his flesh. And thrice he asked God to remove it. And... God said, my grace is sufficient. So Paul said, when I'm weak, then God is strong. And when in things in me don't work, and it comes out right, then that was God working in me and through me. We read earlier that God is never tired, and he is never faint. But we are. We are. And when we are there, God always will give us power, His power. And when we have no strength, God will give us strength. And I hear people say, oh, I know, I got to keep on going. I got to keep, I must, I got to get strength from somewhere. I know if I, if I show myself to be strong, then God will bless me. And No. Because God will do with you what He did with me. On multiple occasions, God will lead you into a trap that you cannot get out of. Has he ever done that to you? And at that time you were going, I must be strong. I must, I, never mind. Can't do it. 